So today we're going to be talking about how foreign trusts are taxed because I think there's a lot of confusion about how foreign trusts are taxed from a U.S. tax perspective. I think people have seen way too many movies and they call me up and they're like, hey, well, can I just put all my stuff in a foreign trust and then I don't have to pay taxes, you know, like the rich people do? It doesn't quite work like that anymore. Those days are over. So I'm going to clear this up today. We're going to go over how the U.S. tax taxes foreign trusts. But before we get into it, always a little CYA. This is for educational purposes only. This is not specific tax, legal, or other advice uh, to anybody. If you need advice in how a foreign tax is trust, or how a foreign trust is taxed, we can definitely help you out. Just give us a call, have a, put our contact information up at the end of this presentation. So first, let's talk about the definition of a foreign trust. Like that's where we have to start, right? So I think the easiest way to do that is by looking at what a U.S. domestic trust is, and that's going to make it then clear what a foreign trust is. So the U.S. tax law does not look at the governing law of a trust as a determining factor as to whether it is a domestic or a foreign trust for U.S. tax purposes. So what I mean by this is it is possible to have a trust formed under the laws of Wyoming that is a foreign trust for U.S. tax purposes. It's a tough concept for a lot of people to wrap their head around that you have a domestic U.S. trust for state law purposes, but it is a foreign trust for tax purposes. And I'll explain why that is. So the U.S tax law looks to two tests to determine whether or not it is a domestic trust. There is a court test and there is a control test. So these two tests work like this. The court test looks to see if a U.S. court can exercise primary supervision over the trust administration. The control test looks to see if U.S. persons control all substantial trust decisions. If both of these tests are met, you have a domestic trust for U.S. tax purposes. All other trusts are foreign trusts. So basically, it doesn't matter under what law this trust is formed. It doesn't matter if it's under U.S. law or the law of a foreign country. What you have to do to determine whether it's domestic or foreign for U.S. tax purposes is apply this court test and the control test. If both tests are met, it's a domestic trust for U.S. tax purposes and liable for tax on, on its worldwide income. All other trusts or foreign trusts are only liable for tax on U.S. source income. But we're going to get into more of that later. First, I just wanted to explain what the definition of a foreign trust is because it's it's not intuitive, right? Because you can have this domestic trust for state law purposes and foreign for, for tax law purposes. So I hope I did a good job explaining that so you guys understand this, we can move on. So like I said, we wind up with this really unique outcome where it's possible where it's possible to have a domestic trust for state law purposes and a foreign trust for tax purposes. And what's really cool about that is it's possible to intentionally fail one of those tests, right? Either the control or, or, or the, the court test or both. And the result is that you intentionally create a trust that is domestic for state law purposes and foreign for tax purposes. So for example, you could have a Wyoming trust that's a Wyoming trust for state law purposes, but for tax purposes, it's a foreign trust and not going to be subject to its worldwide income in the, in the United States, which is a pretty awesome outcome, right? And so this unique tax treatment in the United States has made the U.S., in my opinion, one of the leading trust jurisdictions in the world right now, if not the leading trust jurisdiction in the world, for a bunch of reasons, right? One. There's a lot of states like Wyoming and Delaware and Nevada, South Dakota that have 
very strong asset protection trust laws that are like second to none compared to traditional asset protection trust jurisdictions like the Cayman Islands and Cook Islands and stuff like that. You also have no trust register. So there's no public registry where all the trusts are, are, are registered that they exist. And some countries have that, right? So you can form these trusts completely anonymously. In the United States, trusts are private documents between the trustee and the settler. So usually there's like two or three copies of the trust, right? The lawyer that drafted it, the trustee and, and, and the, the settler, and that's it. So not even the US government knows these trusts exist. So that anonymity and privacy is, is, is amazing. There's not a lot of places where you have that. You also don't have a register of beneficial owners in the United States as to trusts, right? They just passed one that applies to companies, but it doesn't apply to trusts yet. It may in the future, but we'll see. The U.S. also is not a signatory to the Common Reporting Standard. For, for those of you who don't know, the Common Reporting Standard is automatic exchange of information, of banking information between a lot of countries. So, for example, if somebody who lives in Germany signs on an account in Dubai, the Dubai government is going to report that to Germany and Germany is going to know that he has uh, signature authority over these assets in, in Dubai. And that can be problematic because a lot of times Germany, for no reason other than they have an account outside of Germany, starts auditing and harassing people. You don't have these concerns with the United States because they're not a signatory to the common reporting standard. And finally, private trust companies are permitted in some of these jurisdictions, some of the states in the United States, so you can still retain control of the assets. So this was a little bit off topic uh, in terms of how foreign trusts are taxed, but I thought it was interesting information to share that, you know, one, you can have this unique outcome where you can form a U.S. trust, but have it be a foreign trust for U.S. tax purposes, and also share with you all of these benefits that forming a trust in the United States has. So whenever I talk about trusts, I always like to give a brief trust primer so that we're all on the same page, the terminology is familiar, and there's no confusion as we move on. So a lot of people are confused and they actually think trusts are entities like a corporation or an LLC, but they're not. They're actually contracts between a settler, sometimes called a grantor, and the trustee. Now, the settler or grantor is the one who transfers assets into trust. And when we say transfers assets into trust, what we mean is the settler or grantor transfers assets to the trustee to administer those assets for the benefit of the beneficiaries. And the beneficiaries are those who are going to benefit under the trust. So a pretty good example of this is, let's say I wanted to form a trust for the benefit of my kids. I would take my assets and I would transfer them to this third party trustee. And this third party trustee would then own those assets. Legal title vests in the trustee. So the trustee now owns those assets, but not for their own benefit. They have to hold those assets and administer them for the benefit of the beneficiaries. It's basically how a trust works. So now we're gonna get into how the US taxes foreign trusts. And there's two types of foreign trusts from a U.S. tax perspective. There's a foreign grantor trust, and there is a foreign non-grantor trust. So a foreign trust can have either a U.S. grantor, so it's a, it's a U.S. citizen, green card holder, or somebody who meets the substantial presence test who's transferring the assets into the trust, or you can have a non-alien a non-resident alien grantor, which is somebody who's not a U.S. citizen green count holder and somebody who doesn't meet the substantial presence test. Now, a U.S. grantor is a, a, a U.S. grantor trust comes to being when a U.S. grantor makes a gratuitous transfer of assets to a trust that has U.S. beneficiaries or has the potential of having U.S. beneficiaries. And this is very important because even if the trust doesn't have any U.S. beneficiaries now, the U.S. takes a very broad view of this that if it is possible, even in the remotest sense that it may one day have a U.S. beneficiary, then it's going to be considered a, 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 a foreign grantor trust 
because it's a U.S. grantor, there's the possibility that this trust could have a U.S. beneficiary in the future. Now, in very limited circumstances, you can have a non-resident alien grantor trust and still get foreign grantor trust treatment. And the main way that you achieve this is by limiting the distribution provision of the trust so that only the grantor or the grantor spouse can receive distributions from the trust during the lifetime of the grantor. And that has some significance and some benefits uh, of being a, 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 the foreign grantor trust has some benefits from a tax perspective, which we're going to talk about in later slides. Now, the foreign non-grantor trust are all other foreign trusts, okay? So a foreign grantor trust is either it's a U.S. person that transferred assets to a foreign trust, or it is a non-resident alien that transferred assets to a foreign trust, and only the grantor or the grantor spouse can receive distributions from that trust during the grantor's lifetime. All other trusts are foreign non-grantor trusts. So taxation of foreign grantor trusts. So in a foreign grantor trust, the grantor is considered the owner of the foreign trust for tax purposes, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that they're considered the owner of the assets under the trust for like legal title purposes, but for tax purposes, they're considered the owner. And so the grantor as such is required to report and pay tax on the trust's income. So if you have a U.S. grantor, so U.S. citizen, green card holder, or somebody meeting the substantial presence test, they're going to be required to report and pay tax on the trust's worldwide income. So it's basically like they own everything that's in the trust and they have to report it as if they owned it personally. If you have a non-resident alien grantor, then the grant then the non-resident alien grantor, so again, somebody who's not a U.S. citizen, not a green card holder, and doesn't meet the substantial presence test, because they're not a U.S. person, they would only be required to pay tax on U.S. source income. And that means they would have to file a Form 1040NR in the United States and report the trust's income on, the, on, on their individual tax returns as if they owned the trust assets. Now, the big benefit of foreign grantor trusts is that the U.S. beneficiaries, I'm not talking about the grantor, the owner, I'm talking about beneficiaries, are not taxed on distributions from the foreign trust. As long as they get this foreign grantor trust beneficiary statement and file a form 3520 and report the income. And we'll get into the filing requirements with this you know, foreign grantor trust beneficiary statement in a minute, but it's something that generally the trustee would send to the beneficiary. So a huge benefit of this is, let's say I form the, the, the foreign trust, right? And I'm reporting all of its, and it's considered a foreign grantor trust, and I'm reporting all of the income from the trust because I'm the grantor, I'm considered the trust owner. If that trust makes a beneficiary, sorry, if that trust makes a distribution to my kid who's a U.S. person and the trustee sends them this foreign grantor trust owner statement, or sorry, grantor, foreign grantor trust beneficiary statement, and, it, and my kid attaches it to form 3520 and files it, my kid doesn't have to pay any tax on that distribution. That's a pretty cool result. Uh, so that's something to definitely think about. Now, taxation for non-grantor trusts is a little bit different. The taxation of for non-grantor trusts, it's the trust itself that pays the tax, not the grantor, because it's not considered to have an owner. It's a non-grantor trust, right? So in this case, the trust itself would be required to file Form 1041 and report only its U.S. source income, not worldwide income. Now this taxes a little bit differently. So if you recall from the previous slide on a foreign grantor trust, it's the foreign, it's the U.S. grantor or the non-resident alien grantor that pays tax on the trust's income. The trust isn't paying tax in its own right, 
and also the beneficiaries, assuming they get their forms properly, also don't have to pay tax on the distributions. That's not the case here. Here, in a for non-grantor trust, the grantor is not paying tax on the trust's income. The trust is paying tax on its, on its own income, U.S. source only, in, in, in this case, because we're only talking about taxation from the U.S. perspective. But now, with a for non-grantor trust, the distributions to a beneficiary can be taxable to the beneficiary. So distributions of corpus, so the initial trust assets that were put into the trust, those can be taken out tax-free. Distribution of, of current net income, so income earned during the calendar year, that would also be taxable to the beneficiary. And one of the things that's, that's nice about that is income coming out of a trust retains its character, right? So if it's current income that's being distributed from the trust, so, so current income, income earned within that year, that's distributed to the, the beneficiary, it retains its character. So if it's ordinary income, I pay tax at ordinary income rates. But if it's capital gains, for example, I can get the long-term capital gains tax rate of 20% or the qualified dividend rate of 20%. So there are some advantages to the current distribution of, 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 of income and how that's taxed. Now, the kicker though with non-grantor trusts is what happens if the four non-grantor trust distributes income that was accumulated? So for example, Two years ago, the trust earned income, but didn't make any distributions. It just kept the income. That's called accumulated income. When the trust then later makes a distribution of this accumulated income, it's subject to what's called the throwback tax. This is essentially an interest charge on the undistributed in income from the prior years. And it's, it's a punitive tax, right? It's, it's basically a, 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 to punish the beneficiary for having delayed this tax or deferred this tax by keeping it in, in, in the foreign trust. And so when it's distributed, they're subject to this extra throwback tax, which is ungodly complicated to calculate. And a lot of times that tax is so significant that it wipes out almost the entire distribution. So. Now, there are some planning strategies with foreign non-grantor trusts where you can, you know, time the distributions and some other things like this to avoid this throwback tax, but it does take some, some planning, but it is a solvable problem. So foreign grantor trusts, so now I'm going back to foreign grantor trusts. So this is where it's, a, it's either a U.S. grantor with a trust that has a U.S. beneficiary, or it is a foreign grantor and the, the only distributions can be made to the grantor or their spouse during their lifetime. Now we're going to talk about what the U.S. tax obligations are. So for, for grantor trusts, the trustee obligations are as follows. The trustee, this is actually a mistake, it's not the U.S. grantor, it's the trustee must file form 3520A with the IRS to report certain information to the IRS. They also must send a foreign grantor trust owner statement to the U.S. grantor or owner of that foreign trust. And if there's more than one U.S. grantor or owner, then they have to send multiple of these foreign grantor trust owner statements. And they also have to send the foreign grantor trust beneficiary statements to any U.S. beneficiary who received a distribution. That's what's going to keep that U.S. beneficiary from having to pay tax on the distribution they receive. Now it's the U.S. grantor who is going to be penalized if this 3520A is not filed by the trustee. So we generally tell clients, listen, if you can't get your trustee to file this 3520A, then the U.S. grantor should get the 3520A prepared and they should sign it and file it. If it is a foreign grantor trust with a non-resident alien grantor. Then the trustee should send a foreign grantor trust beneficiary statement to every U.S. beneficiary that received a distribution. Without doing that, the beneficiary is going to be subject to U.S. tax. So it's super important that this be filed and, and or, or be sent to, to the, the U.S. beneficiary who received a distribution so they can avoid having to pay tax on this distribution. 
Now, the owner, so the grantor, the U.S. grantor of a foreign grantor trust, uh, as a U.S. person, they're going to be required to file a tax return, usually Form 1040, and they must report the foreign trust's income, expenses, assets, all that stuff on their individual tax return as if they owned all that stuff themselves on the worldwide income of the trust. They also need to file an FBAR for any foreign financial accounts held by the trust. They're going to need to file Form 3520 with the IRS, and they have to ensure that the 3520A is filed by the trustee, and if not by the trustee, that they file it themselves. Now, a non-resident alien owner, so a foreign grantor trust with a non-resident alien grantor, again, remember, it has to be limited uh, the distribution provisions have to be limited so that it can only be made to the grantor or the grantor's spouse during the grantor's lifetime. Basically, they need to file a tax return, Form 1040-NR, and report any U.S. income that the foreign grantor trust had. If it didn't have any U.S. income, no filing required. Um, so now we're going to talk about the beneficiary obligations. So again, we're going back to foreign grantor trusts. So for a foreign grantor trust, the beneficiary needs to file Form 3520 if they received a distribution, and they need to attach this foreign grantor trust beneficiary statement to their Form 3520 in order to avoid that distribution being taxable. Okay? Super important. Now, now we're going to move on to foreign non-grantor trusts. So these are foreign trusts who were settled by a non-resident alien where the distributions are not limited to just the grantor's spouse or the grantor during the grantor's lifetime. So these are most foreign trusts in, in reality. So one, they need to send a foreign non-grantor trust beneficiary statement to each U.S. beneficiary. They need to file a Form 1040-NR to report any U.S. source income the foreign non-grantor trust had. Now the beneficiary obligations under a foreign non-grantor trust. So if they received a distribution, they need to file Form 3520 to report that distribution. They need to report and pay tax on the current year income that was distributed to them. And they also need to report and pay tax on any accumulated income that was distributed to them. And remember, the throwback tax applies here. So that's going to be that, that punitive tax. And then if they received, and, and you see this happen quite a bit, right? That the trust owns a house somewhere and they let the beneficiary use it. Well, you can't do that. The fair rental price of the usage of that property needs to be included as income. So basically, they, a, a beneficiary has to report any, any income or, or the value of trust property used as income and make sure on, on their tax return to make sure to file form 3520. Now, I wanted to give a couple of use cases, right? Because people a lot of times ask me, well, when should I use which trust, right? What situation is the best? So the foreign grantor trust with a U.S. grantor. So this is a U.S. person that is setting up a foreign trust that could potentially have U.S. beneficiaries. There's zero tax advantages to setting up a foreign trust for a U.S. person in, in that situation. There are, however, massive asset protection benefits because the trust is not subject to, to U.S. law and U.S. courts. It's subject to the jurisdiction where it's formed, like Nevis, for example, which has very strong asset protection laws. As a matter of fact, I think a Nevis trust has never been pierced. I think the same is true for the Cook Islands. Um, so you have massive asset protection benefits by setting up a, a foreign trust and the state planning and, and, and all the privacy and all that good stuff that, that goes into asset protection trusts, but there's no tax benefits. So a foreign grantor trust with a U.S. grantor, this is for a United States person who's not looking for tax benefits. They just want to set up a foreign trust for asset protection and estate planning purposes and you know, the other benefits that go into a uh, having a, a, uh, a foreign trust. Now, a foreign grantor trust with a non-resident alien grantor is great for a 
non-resident alien who is married to a U.S. person that wants asset protection and estate planning and all that stuff that goes along with having a foreign trust, but have it so that the distributions that they make to their spouse during their lifetime are tax-free because it's a grantor trust. So this is a really good estate planning solution where you have a husband and wife um, where one of them is a U.S. citizen and one of them is not, and the one that is not the U.S. citizen has a lot of assets and income that they'd like to pass to the U.S. person. This is, this is a great solution for uh, couples where you have one that's U.S. and one's not in the U.S. For non-grantor trusts, these are great for non-U.S. persons who want to set up multi-generational structures. And so multi-generational trust, so basically a trust that is going to last for many, many, many years where generation after generation after generation is going to be a beneficiary of this trust and have that trust provide them with estate planning and asset protection and all that good stuff. So a good example of when a foreign non-grantor trust is, 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 a, is a great strategy is Let's say, for example, you have a non-U.S. person who's a patriarch of a family, and maybe some of his kids became Americans, right? One of the things that he could do is he could set up a foreign non-grantor trust and say that himself, his spouse, his kids, and all bloodline family members descending from, from him and his wife's bloodline, so that's generation after generation, are beneficiaries. So what winds up happening is this trust will always own the assets. It's never going to distribute the assets that were put in it by the patriarch, but it will distribute income generated by the assets in the trust for generations, right? And the big benefit of this is these beneficiaries that come into being over the generations, they're only going to get taxed on the distributions they receive from the trust. They're not going to get taxed on 100% of the income that's generated within the trust because it's not their assets. They're only going to get taxed on the distributions of income they receive. They're also going to have asset protection because the assets are owned by the trust, not by the beneficiary. So they don't even, prenups become a lot less relevant because if they get divorced, they don't have anything. Everything's owned by the trust, right? <laughs> of which their spouse is not a beneficiary and they can't get anything. That also protects the assets from generational wealth tax, from generational transfer taxes like estate taxes, because the assets are always owned by the trust. They're never passing from generation to generation. It's just generation from genera after generation can benefit from those assets. It's also going to offer some wealth tax protection because they don't own those assets, right? So if they move to a country that has wealth taxes, most likely those assets are not going to be allocated to them. It's going to be safe from the wealth tax. So. It's a little bit of education on trusts, a little bit of education on how the U.S. taxes foreign trusts. I hope you found it educational and this answers some of the questions that, that I get a lot of times from my clients. I think a lot of people will be able to use this. Uh, please let me know what you think of this video in the comments section. If you want to contact us for any help, contact details are on the screen. Peace.